You're separated, called out, people. What a privilege to belong to you. What kind of love is this that we've received, that we're the sons and the daughters of the Most High God? God, I pray as we go into our prayer pup tents this week, I pray that your presence would meet us in an extraordinary way. I pray that this would be an extraordinary week of prayer, Lord, as we act like an intercessor, as we come before you with adoration and confession and truth remembered and with supplication. God, I pray in Jesus' name that your presence would meet us. I pray that at the door of our prayer pup tent, Lord, you would meet us there and that our prayer time would be dynamic. I pray that we would get promoted to intercessors, Lord. I pray the mantle of intercession would fall down on our congregation, Lord. I pray that no one would ever say of our church, there's a congregation that doesn't believe in the power of prayer. Father, I pray, God, that you'd make us intercessors for Greenwich. I pray that you'd make us intercessors for Connecticut. Make chapter 9 and beginning in verse 1. It says, After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves sep separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. Like those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Socialites. Those are the ancient inhabitants of Greenwich. <laughs> Look at verse 2. They've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves, and their sons have mingled the holy race with the people around them, and the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. Look at Ezra's response to this news. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak. I pulled my hair from my head and beard. I sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn, and I fell on my knees with my hands stretched towards God, and I prayed, Oh my God, I'm too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and have reached to the heavens. I'm not going to read all the words of Ezra's great prayer of intercession. You should go home and read them, but very much like Daniel's prayer that we talked about last week, he goes on and on for several more verses confessing the sins of his nation. But I want you to look with me in Ezra 10 at God's response to this prayer. Look in Ezra 10 in verse 1. While Ezra was still praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men and women and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the people around us, but in spite of this, there is still hope for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for every person that you brought here today. Lord, they're not here by accident. Lord, they're here to receive from you. I pray that you'd speak a living word in the heart of each person. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, in a small town in Texas, a bar owner bought a piece of property right across the street from the Baptist church, and he started to build a new bar. The church people were absolutely beside themselves. They were upset about the impact on the neighborhood. They were upset about the impact on the morals of the town, on the morals of their teenagers and their children. They circulated petitions through the town. They started holding outdoor prayer vigils to stop the construction of the bar. The whole town was in an uproar over the controversy. Nevertheless, work on the bar moved right along. The church folks kept praying harder and harder until it came right up into the night before the grand opening. That night, a string of very strong thunderstorms rolled through the town and the bar was struck by lightning and it burned down to the ground. The church people were gleeful. In fact, they were actually smug until they got served with a notice that they were being sued by the bar owner for the destruction of his property. In their brief 
They vehemently denied any responsibility. They denied any connection whatsoever with the fire that burned down the bar. Finally, the day of the trial arrived and the entire town showed up, packed out the courthouse to see what would happen. The judge made his way to the bench and after he was settled, he looked over his glasses and he said, well, I've reviewed the complaint and I've reviewed the church's answer. And it seems that we have a very curious case before us. Apparently, we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation who does not. (laughs) What about you? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe that prayer has the power to change the landscape and the atmosphere of your town? Do you believe that prayer has the power to awaken the moral conscience of a nation? Do you believe that prayer has the power to turn a backslidden society back to God? Do you believe that prayer has the power to cause self-serving, immoral, negligent leaders to have a change of heart? Do you believe that prayer has the power to cause rampant immorality to be reversed? Ezra's prayer of intercession resulted in one of the most dramatic national changes that occurred in the Bible. And as I look at Ezra's prayer, I see three keys to praying for a change. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three keys to praying for a change. First of all, when people need a change, pray for a change. When people need a change, pray for a change. Pastor Nick put up a great quote last week by an old Methodist pastor. It said, the one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion." He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. If you really want to make a difference in the world, become an intercessor. You see, prayer is required to change the heart of a nation. Prayer is required to revive the heart of a nation. Last week, we talked about King Cyrus from Persia. He sent the Jewish people back to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. About 80 years after the first wave of settlers went home, Artaxerxes sent Ezra to Jerusalem with another contingent of people. Ezra is an interesting figure. He was a Jewish priest. He was an especially gifted teacher of the word of God. He was also an officer of the Persian court with a royal commission. Artaxerxes sent Ezra with the orders to re-educate the Jewish people in their own religion. You see, in Babylon, the Jews had almost forgotten their faith. They had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten who their great God is. So Ezra was ordered by a Persian king to go help the Jewish people become Jews again. And listen, if anybody didn't listen to Ezra... He had the power to confiscate their property. He had the power to imprison them. He had the power to banish them from the country or even execute them. You want to talk about a captive audience. Listen or else. When Ezra got to Jerusalem, he found things in very bad shape. He found that the Jewish men were marrying women from the neighboring countries, which God had strictly forbidden them to do. And he found that the priests and the leaders of the people were leading the way in this sin. Their children were being raised to be idol worshipers instead of worshipers of Yahweh. This was the very same sin that had caused their great-grandfathers to be taken captive in the first place. The Jewish people were in danger of extinction. What's amazing to me is Ezra's response to the situation. Of all the options available to him, Ezra chose to pray. He had a strong teaching gift in the word, but he chose to pray instead. 
He wielded religious authority as a priest, but he chose to pray instead. He had political authority to write laws and to enforce them, but he chose to pray instead. Listen, Ezra understood that national change requires more than reasoning with people. National change requires more than an appeal to religious duty. It requires more than legislation. Ezra understood that national change requires first a change of heart. And that requires prayer. When people need a change, pray for a change. People are in bad shape today. They need a change. Senior adults need a change. Middle-aged adults need a change. Do you know that two-thirds of the adult population in the United States is addicted either to illicit drugs or to prescription drugs? Young adults need a change. Most of them never want to get married, and they definitely never want to have kids. Teenagers need a change. Tweens need a change. Children need a change. People in your life need a change. Your family needs a change. Your friends need a change. Your neighbors, your coworkers need a change. What would happen if instead of all the other things that we normally do, we prayed for a change? You know, we're awfully good at lecturing. We're awfully good at starting fights on Facebook. We're awfully good at blah, 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 blogging. But what would happen if we interceded for people instead? We're good at chastising people. We're good at guilt tripping people. We're good at coercion. We're good at party platforms. But what if we prayed for a change? You know, Paul prayed that people would have an encounter with the love of God that surpasses knowledge. The secret to true transformation is not your ability to present a cogent argument to the human mind, but it rests on the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit in the human heart, and that requires prayer for change. When people need a change, become an intercessor. When people need a change, acts like an intercessor. Now, that's bad grammar, but you're about to find out is good preaching. When people need a change, acts like an intercessor. Over the last couple of weeks, I've had great conversations with people about prayer. So many people are just kind of wading deeper into prayer and and growing in their capacity to pray. We talked about the habits of an intercessor. We talked about having your own prayer pup tent like Moses, having your own private place where you can go and you can pour your heart out to God. But once you get into that prayer pup tent, what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to pray? You know, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And I have found in all of these intercessory prayers that we've looked at together that there is a pattern of prayer. And if you and I use it, it can help us grow in our prayer life too. Specifically, it can help us to grow in our ability to be an intercessor. So all you have to remember is acts. All you have to remember is A-C-T-S. First of all, A stands for adoration. A stands for adoration. The way to begin your prayer time is with worship. And the way to sustain your prayer time is with worship. You know, Jesus began the Lord's Prayer with adoration. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Blessed is your name. Highly esteemed is your name by saints and angels in heaven and on earth. Daniel's prayer is full of adoration. Ezra's prayer here in Ezra 9 is full of adoration. God, you are gracious. God, you are kind. God, you are a giver of good gifts. God, you are merciful. You haven't punished us as our sins deserve. God, you are righteous. God, you are a promise keeper. Begin your prayer with adoration. You know, you can even take a CD and you can put on a worship song and you can let it pray while you just quiet your heart. And then when that song runs out, you can begin making a melody of your own in your heart. 
You can begin adding your own lyrics and just begin praising God for his greatness and his goodness. God, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your loyal love. I thank you that you're a promise keeper. I thank you for your unfailing patience. I thank you for your tender mercies, your loving kindnesses. God, I thank you that you never change. I thank you that you're the author and the finisher. I'm about to start praying. I thank you, Lord, that, that you're the beginning and the end of my journey before you do anything else in worship pray worship brings you into God's presence you know I I put it wrong I I almost said that worship brings God's presence to you but that's not theologically accurate actually worship brings you into God's presence it brings you into his habitation he inhabits the praises of his people. Worship brings you into the realm of God's authority. It brings you into his royal court where whatever he says goes. God is enthroned on the praises of his people. Worship builds up your faith as you remind yourself again and again of who God is. Worship practice, is practicing humility by putting God in his place. It immediately puts us in our place. As, as you begin your prayer time, before you do anything else, worship. Acts, A-C-T-S, adoration, and then C is for confession. C is for confession. We talked quite a bit about confession last week. Hebrews says that before we can approach God to intercede for others... We have to deal with our own junk first. James said, confess your sins and then pray. John said, if our conscience is clean, then we can go and pray in confident faith that God hears us and he'll answer. You know, depending on how your week is going, you might already be aware of some things that you need to confess to the Lord. Lord's salty words have flowed over my lips out of the fountain of my heart. Lord, I've been quick to get angry this week. Lord, I've treated people badly this week. I've treated them with less dignity than they deserve and you would require. Lord, I've let temptation run away with me this week. You might already know when you go to prayer the, the things that you need to just bring before the Lord. Listen, worship him and then just get them out of the way so you can have a good prayer time. We talked about incorporating David's prayer inviting the Holy Spirit to come and just reveal to us anything we need to confess. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test my thoughts. Examine my ways. See if there be any wicked thing in me and lead me forward in your path of everlasting life. Pray that prayer. In fact, use those words. The Bible is a book of prayer. The prayers that are recorded in the Bible are, are for you and for me to actually incorporate into our own prayer life to help us to grow in our ability to pray. I pray I use the words of David. You can use them too. And invite the Holy Spirit to search you and then just sit quietly and wait for a little bit. You'd be surprised how quick God will answer you. He'll begin bringing to your mind uh, things that you haven't thought about in a long time. Stuff will pop into your head. And as you begin to pray about those things, as you begin to confess them and lay them before the Lord, more things will come. You'll begin to make connections that you didn't see before, that you didn't realize. And you understand, man, some of this junk has been, been holding me back. And I just want to move forward and press forward. So I'm going to lay it all out there before the Lord. Acts like an intercessor, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, and then T is for truth remembered. T is for truth remembered. As you get ready to lift your request to the Lord, stop and think about what God has already said about it in his word. In prayer, Ezra recalled what God had said. He recalled that God had been true to the word, his word in the past, and he recalled what God had said about the future. Abraham did the very same thing. Moses and Daniel and Nehemiah all did the same thing. They remembered the truth of the word. The word fills us with hope. It fills us with faith. It tells us what God wants to do for us and what he wants us to do for him.
Listen, if your family is in a mess, remember what God has said about it as you go to prayer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your whole house. You are the first fruits of salvation among your family. The unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save, says the Lord. He repays the sins of the fathers on the third and the fourth generation, but he shows love and mercy to a thousand generations of those who keep his commands. If you're sick, if someone that you love is sick, remember what God has already said about it in his word. I am the God that healeth thee. I sent my word and I healed your disease. For you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in the corner of his prayer saw. Healing is the children's bread. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The price of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed you shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord to the next generation if you're in financial need if someone you love is in financial need remember what God has said about it and my God shall supply all your needs kata too, not in proportion to your needs, but in proportion to his ability to provide. I have been young and I have been old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children out begging for bread. Give and it shall be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will cause men to pour into your laps. He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater and God is able to make all all grace abound to you so that at all times you have everything you need to abound to every good work. Come on, give the Lord a praise, would you? Truth remembered. Pray the Bible back to God. One of the, the keys to answered prayer is to pray in alignment with the will of God, Jesus said. The Bible is always in alignment with God's will. And so when you pray the scriptures, when you remember the truth and pray it back to God, you know you're always praying in alignment with his will. Acts like an intercessor. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, truth remembered. And finally, S is for supplication. With your faith built up through worship, with your sins out of the way through confession, with your will aligned to God's will through the word, go and ask God for what you need. Ask God for the change that others need. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Ask with confidence because you belong to God. Because he's your father and he's a good father that he's going to supply what you need. When people need a change, pray for a change. Imagine what would happen if we all started praying if 10 intercessors would have been enough to save a wicked city like Sodom. Imagine what would happen if a thousand of us here got into our prayer pup tents and began to act like intercessors, began to adore and confess and remember truth and make supplication to the Lord. Imagine it would be the book of Acts all over again right here in Greenwich. Three keys to praying for change. When people need a change, pray for a change. Second this, when people need a change, pray for a big change. When people need a change, pray for a big change. The problem in Ezra's day was mixed marriages between Jews and Gentiles. You know, at first glance, we're very far removed from this situation. So at first glance, we imagine what's the big deal? And when we read the remedy in Ezra chapter 10, it is almost incomprehensible to us. We live in a very different day, but there are very relevant truths here. Those mixed marriages were an act of defiant disobedience to God. They knew what God had said, but they just disregarded it. They were an act of spiritual compromise. 
They put the pursuit of their own happiness and pleasure ahead of their relationship with God. They were an act of moral compromise. The prophet Malachi sheds a little bit more light to what was going on in Ezra's day. The Jewish men were actually divorcing their Jewish wives and turning around and marrying Gentile wives for convenience and for political and business advantages. The mixed marriages were a stronghold of iniquity that had gone all the way back to Israel's beginning. Do you know that this, the list of uh, neighboring tribes listed here in Ezra 9 is the exact same list that God gave to the people when they first moved into the neighborhood. They just never could keep their hands off those girls. And even after a thousand years and a 70-year captivity in Babylon, that iniquity was still in their heart and it wasn't out. And worst of all, nobody was bothered by it. But when Ezra realized what was going on, his heart was broken. He said, when I heard this, I tore my tunic, I, I tore my coat, I pulled hair out of my head and out of my beard. Ouch! He said, I fell on my knees speechless. I was ashamed. I, I prayed, God, I'm too ashamed to even lift my face to you. I'm blushing here because we are over our heads in sin. Ezra was appalled by the sin of his nation. He was speechless. He was dumbfounded. He was grieved to the core of his being. I wonder when was the last time that we felt like that about America? When was the last time that we were heartbroken over the sins of our nation? Some people say, well, Pastor Glenn, you know, they're, they're unsaved. We can't expect any better from them. Well, perhaps not, but we can want better for them. When Paul visited Athens... He saw the tens of thousands of idols and the altars that were built to pagan gods, one even to an unknown god, and Paul's heart was broken for the lostness of that city. Does the lostness of America break your heart? Can I tell you that America is coming apart at the seams? The fabric of our society is unraveling right in front of our eyes. We are seeing every day, you're following what's happening. You follow even the news, you see what's happening in Chicago. Three-year-olds getting shot in the crossfire of gang violence. Come on, people. Does it make you grieve? Ezra interceded for a big change in his country. And we need big changes, too. Can I tell you something, beloved? It's time to bring blushing back. It's time to bring blushing back in the church. The sins of the nation made Ezra blush. That's literally what it says here in Hebrew. He says, God, I'm too ashamed to look you in the eyes. I'm blushing here. Beloved, the sins of our culture uh, ought to shock us. They ought to embarrass us. They ought to make us ashamed. They ought to grieve our spirits and break our hearts. There's lots of examples that I thought to throw out over the pulpit, but I can't even say them because, you know, Paul said it's a disgrace to even speak about the things that they do in darkness. The moral restraints have been removed almost completely from our society. And just like in Ezra's day, our leaders have led the way. Politicians and celebrity personalities, educators, even priests and pastors. Can I tell you, the headlines ought to make us blush. The stuff flying around on the, the internet, it ought to make us blush. The stuff on TV, the stuff happening out on the streets, it, it ought to make us blush. We are over our heads in sin. And listen, believers are not only guilty of tolerating it, we've actually joined the world in celebrating it. God said to Jeremiah, look at the sins of the nation. And he said, my people, they don't even blush. They don't even cringe. They don't even blink at it anymore. Beloved, can I tell you, we need some good teaching. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order Pastor Nick to put together a good teaching on love because we, we need to be reminded from the Bible what, what, true, what true love really is. We need to be reminded what true love really is. Can I tell you, beloved, love speaks up. Love confronts. 
<laughs> love butts in. Love sticks its nose in where it's not invited. Love pleads. It's no kind of love at all that just sits on its hands or, or holds its tongue and does nothing while people march to hell. We need big changes. The church must engage culture without marrying it. You know, thousands of years after Ezra, mixed marriages are still a problem. Jesus has called us to be role models to the world. He said, you are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. We're called to be role models to the world, but instead we've been imitators of the world. Jesus said, go into the world, engage culture. But instead of engaged in culture, we've gone and married it. We've espoused the world's ways of life. We've espoused their philosophies. We've espoused their values. We've espoused their morals. We've worshipped their idols. Beloved, listen to me. Everybody look at me because I'm preaching a little hard at you right now. You still love me this morning? I'm just a, I'm just, I'm just a little hard. Listen, listen. I don't, as my friend Jackson Sinyanga says, I don't say this to frighten you. I say this to terrify you. If we don't have this clear in our heart and settled in our mind, you will never make it and stay faithful to Jesus in what is coming in the days ahead. God has called us to be different. God has called us to be set apart, his holy people. You know, the very word church means set apart. God has called us to think differently, to speak differently, to behave differently. He's called us to have different values, priorities, moral standards, and objectives. Oh, that God would raise up in our day uh, an Ezra company. That God would raise up a company of teacher intercessors that would reorient the church to our own faith. You know what's happening in the day that we live in? God is actually sending ministers from other countries now to come back to the church in America and to teach the church in America the things that the American missionaries taught them a hundred years ago. We need a re-education. We need a reawakening in our heart and and a retraining of our thinking. We need a big change. Drastic sins call for drastic measures. Drastic sins call for drastic measures. Listen to me. The remedy to the problem of mixed marriages was so drastic in Ezra 10 that it actually offends our sensibilities. The Jewish men had to send away their Gentile wives back to their families of origin and they sent away their own children that were born in those marriages. So the remedy to this problem of mixed marriages was divorce and the breaking up of families and the separation of children from their own fathers. Can I tell you that's about as harsh as it gets. But it reminds us of a critical truth that I think we need to hear today. When it comes to repentance, there is no such thing as moderation. There's no such thing as to repent only a little bit. Repentance is, is an all or nothing kind of proposition. If there's not a big change, then there's been no change at all. You know, Jesus talked about that. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with one eye than to be thrown into hell with both eyes wide open. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life uh, with uh, an amputee maimed than to be thrown into hell with both your hands and both your feet flying. Now, everybody look at me. Jesus did not, everybody look, look, it's, get this. Jesus did not literally mean to pluck out your eye or chop off your hand, okay? I don't want you to, it's, I, don't, I don't want to go to the hospital today and pray for a restorative miracle. I have faith, but I don't know that it's that strong today. That's not what Jesus meant. What Jesus did mean is that drastic sins call for drastic measures. That we need to take drastic steps toward eradicating sin out of our lives. Do whatever it takes to get clean before the Lord. Confess to whom 
ever, you must confess. Confess to your pastor. Confess to your spouse. Confess to your prayer partner. If you're a student, confess to your parents. Go for deliverance prayer if you need to. Go for Christian counseling if you need to. Join Christian support groups if you need to. We have a, a brand new men's group that just started on Monday evenings. Our friend Mike Morris is running it. He's a Christian counselor. It's called Clean. And the purpose of the group is to help men recapture the spiritual authority that God has intended for us by walking in purity and integrity before him. Throw out whatever needs to be thrown out. Cut off whatever relationships need to be cut off. Never return to the places that you must go. Drastic sins call for drastic measures. Listen, if it causes you to sin, get rid of your stupid smartphone. It's better to go through life without an iPhone than to be thrown into hell texting. <laughs> Repentance is costly. It was painful for those men to send their wives away. It was painful for those men to send their own children away. But it was the price that their repentance required. And repentance will cost you and I too. We need big changes. But how many of you know that big changes are still possible in America? Three keys to praying for a change. Pray for a change. Pray for a big change. And finally, when people need a change, pray until you see a change. When people need a change, pray until you see a change. Worship team, come help me if you would. Ezra prayed through until something happened. Just like Daniel, Ezra was praying on this particular day for about six hours until the time of the evening sacrifice, and then something happened. The Holy Spirit convicted the hearts of the people in Jerusalem. They began to see their sin. They began to see the serious nature of it. They began to blush. They began to grieve in their hearts. They began to weep. They fell down beside Ezra and they began to confess their sins. They came to Ezra and they said, please tell us what must we do. We're willing to do anything you say to get it right. Now you know about ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, truth remembered, and supplication. Let me give you one more thing for your prayer life this week. Let me tell you about push. Do you know what push means? It means pray until something happens. Jesus said, pray and never give up praying. He said, ask Seek and knock. Pray with escalating intensity. Pray with escalating anticipation. Pray, pray, pray. And God will answer, answer, answer you. Pray until something happens. Pray with fasting. Pray individually and pray with others. An amazing thing happened. A crowd gathered around Ezra and they began to pray along with him. You know what conventional wisdom says? Smile and the whole world smiles with you. Cry and you cry alone. Sermons about blushing, sermons about grieving over the sins of our nation. They are not crowd pleasers, but there is a company of people who still trembles at the word of God. There is a company of people who still believes that the Bible is true. And if you begin praying, they'll come and they'll pray with you too. Pray privately in your pup tent and pray in significant public places. Ezra prayed in a private room in the temple. He also prayed in front of important public buildings. And beloved, I tell you that I believe that's a key for us if we want to see national transformation. Yesterday, there was a group of Christians from all over Connecticut at our state capitol praying all day in front of the state capitol. It's part of a 40-day prayer and fasting initiative that they're involved with. Actually, our friends at Presbyterian Church of Old Greenwich, PCOG, have invited us to come and join with them this coming Thursday evening at 7 and to go and to pray together and pray for our state, to pray for our city, to pray for New England, to pray for the suburbs of New York and to pray for revival to come here. 
Last year, there was a tent in Washington, D.C., set up on the White House lawn for 40 days and 40 nights. Believers from all 50 states came and prayed for 40 days, 24-7, day and night, for transformation in our nation. We took a group of people down. We took a minivan. We could only hold seven. You know, they just set that tent up again. They're starting this Thursday, 40 more days of prayer and fasting right on the lawn of the White House. This year, I have two sprinters, so maybe there's some people who like to go on a little road trip to Washington, D.C., and go down and pray in front of a public place for transformation in our nation. Pray until something happens. Push. Pray until you see a grassroots revival. Ezra had the unique authority, if he wanted to, to force transformation on the people. But rather than going for a top-down reform, he went for an inside-out reform. Rather than flexing his muscles, rather than writing laws, rather than coercing people, he went into his prayer tent and he prayed until a change of heart occurred and there was a grassroots inside out revival. Beloved, can I tell you the history of America is the history of wave after wave after wave of revival and it's not too late for God to send one more wave to our country. A grassroots movement. Come on, let's get back to God. Pray until you see a revival of spontaneous repentance. It has happened before. It's happened right in New York City. There was a prayer revival in the late 19th century and the Holy Spirit moved over the city of New York in such a way that people would drop to their knees on street corners. I don't mean just two or three nut jobs. I mean 50, 60, 100, sometimes 300 people. They'd stop traffic in the streets of Manhattan because the Spirit of God fell on them in a way of conviction and they fell on their knees right in the middle of the street and began crying out to God to forgive their sins and to have mercy on them. Can I tell you what has happened before can happen again because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pray. Pray until you see transgenerational repentance. Pray until you people come and seek out your counsel and your leadership. Pray until national remorse becomes real national transformation. Pray, pray, pray. Pray until something happens. Do you believe in the power of prayer? I want to tell you this and end with this. Beloved, as long as there are intercessors, there is always hope. As long as there are intercessors, there is always hope. It is not too late for the United States of America. It is not too late for New York City. It's not too late for New England. It's not too late for your family. It's not too late for your friends. As long as there are intercessors, there is always hope. Let me end with this beautiful promise. You know it from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. You could say it with me. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their lands. That's in the book of Second Chronicles. Do you know who wrote the book of Second Chronicles? It was Ezra, the intercessor teacher. As long as there are intercessors, there is always hope. Stand on your feet. Give Jesus a great big praise in this place. Come on. Give him a big praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Let's give him a big praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Let's adore him. Let us adore Him. Let us adore Him. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Come and behold Him. Bow down before. Jesus Christ is 
let us adore. Let us adore Him. That sounds so good. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus Christ. Come and behold, come and behold him, bow down before him, Jesus Christ is the Lord. Come on, worship him one more time. We worship you, we worship you. Come on, church, worship him one more time. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Come on, lift up your hands to heaven. We got to go. Time's up. But let me just pray for you, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that the mantle of intercession, Lord, would fall down on us, Lord. Father, I pray that you would make us intercessors. Father, I pray that no one would ever say of this congregation that we don't believe in the power of prayer. God, make this a house of intercession, Lord. God, make this a tent of intercession, Lord God. Father, I pray you'd raise us up to stand in the gap. As long as there are intercessors, there is hope. Lord, make us intercessors for New York City. Make us intercessors for Connecticut. Make us intercessors for New England. Make us intercessors for the United States of America. Make us intercessors for our family. Make us intercessors for our workplace. Make us intercessors for our schools, Lord. Make us intercessors for our neighborhoods, Lord God. Father, make us intercessors. God, I pray this would be a week of dynamic prayer. Pray as we go into our prayer tent and we just do those acts, Lord, as we adore you, as we confess, as we remember truth, as we make supplication, as we make petitions. I pray, God, that prayer would be just exciting. I pray that it would be a dynamic partnership with the Holy Spirit. I pray that we would grow. Lord, let us do a year's worth of growing in our prayer life in a week this coming week, Lord. Father, we thank you. And as we go our own way, I pray the cloud of your presence would just envelop us. Pray that your protection would surround us. Pray that your provision would accompany us and your providence lead us until we come together again and everyone said amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord one more praise. All right, God bless you, everybody. Hug three or four people. Tell them it's going to be a great week. We'll see you Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're here every night this week. Just bring your cot. Have a great week in Jesus.